Should we start? All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're just having a look, just before we started, I was trying to take a selfie. There's a little blue box just on the pole here. People looking behind the pole. A little blue box is just in front of me, and it's really tiny. And I find it really interesting because normally those things are really massive. And there's quite a feed, it looks like, it's also on top of my presentation. So I'm hoping it's not going to cover anything. I'm a very curious person. Um, I'm also very happy I can talk in English because my Dutch, I'm from Belgium, so you wouldn't really understand my Dutch anyway. <laughs> Some people would also not really call it Dutch. I'm a very curious person. Last night I couldn't sleep because I've done, I've never done a presentation before. So I was walking around, as I told you in the loop, and, and I was walking around with my phone and I was calling home and I go, oh, I'm really stressed, I don't know what to do. This is going to really stress me out. So I'm calling home. And you know one of those moments when you're calling and you don't really know what you're doing? How many of you know what this is? Only one. Three people. Okay, only three. Stop raising your fingers. <laughs> uh, I didn't know what this was. So I was outside of my Airbnb at one o'clock at night, couldn't sleep, a bit stressed out, walking around, and I see this little thing. It's like a knob somehow. And I'm, I'm playing with it. I'm turning it, I'm twisting it, and I'm pulling it. And I'm just calling home and I go, yeah, the session's really stressing me out. I'm going to go try to go to sleep again. And I'm pulling and I'm pulling and I'm pulling it. And after, and you can pull it out, but it still is attached to the wall somehow. It's a very old house. And after five minutes, the Airbnb host, look, you can pull it out. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> <laughs> and after five minutes, the Airbnb host meets me and, and opens the door like angry. And, and he's like in his pajamas. And he goes like, can you stop ringing the door? It's really loud. <laughs> it's a doorbell. Isn't that amazing? I've never seen a doorbell like that. Netherlands is awesome. Okay, so. <laughs> um, my name is hopefully going to be my only fail today. Uh, my name is Matthew Spillaway. Um, I am one of the volunteers at Fondant United. I see a few people here also, I've been on my loop, also working at Fondant United sometimes, uh, or volunteering. Um, it's a volunteer organization where we bring people that have the same passion as us um, closer together by organizing conferences. I'm also now playing the visionary behind Kupoi.io, um, and we're going to talk a bit more about that today. Um, and you can always reach me on email or on Twitter. Now, I have a lot of stuff to cover. I plan to use every second of this fine morning to tell you loads of stuff, the things I've been working on. So, we're going to talk about very first um, the analysis. So I worked on a project um, with a big team, quite a complex project. I worked on it for two years, um, and afterwards I kind of dived in afterwards to see what is the complexity, what is what did we actually now deliver as a website. After I've done and explained that analysis to you, I will um, hopefully be able to show you the problem I all think we collectively forgot we had. Now, once I've done that, I've also come up with a solution, otherwise it would be a really shitty presentation. Now, let's start with the backend analysis. Well, mind you, I am a front-end developer, so this is with a grain of salt. Um, we looked at a very complex website, and we kind of found that when we analyze all the lines of code, all, if, if every line of code is one bit of complexity, or every file is one piece of complexity, and you analyze all the files in Drupal, and you strip away the vendors and the libraries, you end up with this number. And the number is 62% of the website you sell is Drupal core, which is amazing, because it's Drupal, right? On top of that, we download 33% of content modules. Now, this is a very complex project again, just a one case example, um, but it already shows that on a very complex website, only 5% of the code base of the thing that we sold is custom code. I think for me, the 5% is an amazing number because if you wouldn't make your website with Drupal, you would need to go 2,000% over budget, which is a lot, which we sometimes already do, but it would be an extra 2,000%. Uh, the 5% also means that it's amazingly productive. Even if you just compare the 5% of custom code you write to the 33% of contract, that means that for every feature you develop, for every complex thing you build yourself, 
you download seven other complex things first. That's amazingly productive. Now, um, let's move on to the front-end analysis. The front-end analysis is very, <laughs> very different. In the front-end, we build stuff we love to build stuff in the front, right? But we always start completely from scratch. We almost start from a complete white piece of paper. 4% of what we build our front end upon, we all, we all find this normal after a while, right? But 4% of what we build our front end, front end upon comes from Drupal. All the rest is custom. Custom JavaScript, custom CSS. Um, and I find it a bit baffling because all the backend benefits we get from all this reusable code, nearly none of those apply to the front end. So why is that? Now, this is a very holistic approach to things, right? Um, but I find it amazing that we don't rely at all on already written code. We don't rely on, all, on downloading large pieces of content, Drupal specific, we all have to download our libraries. Um, but almost everything is from scratch, nearly all the time. Now, if we if we visualize that difference, the better then, again, Drupal core, contract, custom backend, this is coming from front end, uh, from core or contract, and all the rest is custom. It's quite telling what I'm going to tell you the problem is, right? Um, we have a 95% predictability of what's going to come out of Drupal, every project over and over again. Yet, we rebuild everything from scratch over and over again. Something is not right. Now, the top is the back-end layer, right? The bottom is the front-end layer. That's actually a lie, and we all know it. It's not a layer. A layer is an abstraction where you combine things upon. We don't combine things on. We compile everything with our tools, and then we create this massive blob of JavaScript and CSS, and then we ship it to the end user. We ship it to the end user and we say, here you go. The team wrote loads of CSS and JavaScript and here you have everything. We all write our SAS or, or just CSS, all very component specific, right? Who writes their CSS component specific? Or SAS or this or... Yeah, we all have this logic of, yes, of course, that has to happen. But how many of those that write component-based SAS also compile everything into one CSS file? Because that's just how we always have been doing it. We all do that that way. We write our JavaScript very modular, or very modular. We, we write it very component specific, yet we compile everything into one file and then we ship it to the browser. We say, look, here's all the JavaScript, all the team members wrote on this project. So here you go, go compile it. And all of a sudden they go, oh, Jesus, we might have some sort of a tree shaking mechanism needed where we have to split everything back up again. And it's, it's ridiculous. Um, I don't call this the front-end layer. I call this the front-end blob, because we love to compile everything together. Um, it's a closely knitted together front-end blob. For example, also the libraries API. I think it has been existing since Drupal 6, since I've been active, uh, probably also a bit before in some sort of way. Uh, the libraries API has literally been invented for Drupal front-enders. Yet, if you have a Drupal team, we only ever use one library, we call it the global. It's one library, but it has been invented for this very specific purpose, where we can have multiple libraries, yet we never do. We make all of our teams, all of our teams, work with beautiful team components, yet we can't share them between each other. We have, we all, why do we all love Drupal backend? We love it because it's an open source collaboration, yet the collaboration seems to stop as soon as we start talking about the front end. Why? It's because of the blob. I think if you stop making these blobs where we compile everything together and then you go, here you go, you can't really take anything out of it, you can't really change anything, you can't really reuse it, it's just a big blob. And the blob will never fit on any other project, so we <coughs> restart our work over and over. If we split up this blob, and as soon as we get over that pers personal need of compilation and compilating everything together, we have a system of components. Then we have again a content layer that is combining components together, which has always been the intention of Drupal anyway. Um, 
If you keep components separate, you can share them between projects. And you can not only share them between projects, you can also share them between developers. And the developers don't even have to be working for the same agency because there's components that would work together. That would mean that we can have reusable front-end components that can just share between each other. Now, we are at Drupal Jam, so I don't need to explain to you what the advantages are of open sourcing our own front-end components. That's the thing I want to talk about. That's my dream. Now, you're in luck, because um, I had this dream already for a year, and I've been dreaming about it at work, I've been dreaming about it at home, I had loads of trouble at home, because I kept on talking about this. Uh, no one really understood it also. Uh, I also talked about it at work, I literally dreamed out loud, but because I dreamed out loud, um, and I couldn't really work on the project anymore, I kept on dreaming, like, well, what if we do this? What if we do it that way? And I tried to explain it as good as I could, and I tried to explain it so well that they fired me because of it. Which is amazing news, because that's a year ago, and I have been working on the solution for a year. So that's why, <laughs> that's why I gave this presentation. Because um, this is kind of, if this doesn't work, then <laughs> I'm going back to searching for a job. Um, <laughs> All right, so, how does that solution look like? The very first part, that, and that's the most important thing of this presentation, the most important thing is that we have a new team structure, where we retake the teaming layer that we were given by Drupal, and we make it our own again, and we say, look, it's an actual teaming layer. We no longer compile everything together. We no longer take some practices the other front-end community has. We have loads of other benefits that we can use from inside Drupal that have already been there since Drupal 6, yet we never use it. So we're gonna split up the teaming layer, and then we're gonna have loads of advantages. Now, the thing on top, so it's in three layers, and the bottom layer is the most required one. That, that's just, it's so obvious we should do it. I, I hope you're all gonna have like, ah oh, yeah, of course, we're gonna do it this way. All the other things are optional. For example, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you a tooling workflow I build on top, to help you as front-end developers to not waste more time and to pitch to your employer, oh, hey, I've made something and uh, it's gonna be something new, so it's gonna need some time. No, that's something really simple, it's a new abstraction, but I have built the tools for it so we can keep working quite fast. Um, once I've explained the tools, I'm also gonna share a platform with you that I've also built, because if we have all these neat components, they don't really fit in Drupal.org yet, so why don't we share them between each other on a platform? And we can collaborate with them. That's the final piece. So the very first thing is Compoli.io. Um, I'm going to talk more about that later. But the very first thing I want to cover is the component Compoli team, which is a new team structure and a tooling mechanism built within. So the new team structure. How did I do that? Well, if you, if you download the Compoli team, it looks very simple. It looks just as any other team, this team is now called my team, and we have a .team file, we have a libraries file, we have an input file. All those things are exactly the same thing. Now, we have two folders. The top one is the SAS Essentials folder, and that's just a healthy folder. You can actually ignore that one too. The only relevant folder is the components folder, and why? Because the teaming layer is just a collection of components. This is going to echo a lot, right? Um, now, if you open up that components folder, you just have other folders because it's a collection of components, right? And every component has its own folder. It's that simple. If you open up a component, that's where it gets interesting because I'm going to show you more than just folders, I just realized. Um, if you open up component, then, for example, this is how the status messages component that I've built, just as an example. Um, then you have the SAS file. But no, the first abstraction you should see is you have a disk folder within your component. Why? Because we stop compiling all of our shit into one file. We compile it component-based. So we have a disk folder where we can have our destination files. So the SAS gets compiled in the CSS, the JavaScript is the deleted version of the file in the root, and the image is the optimized image. And it all goes automatically. Now that's the first abstraction I want to show you. There's a disk folder inside your component because the component should completely stand on its own. Quite straightforward to have it that way. Um, the other two things you see is a libraries.yaml file and a HTML quick file. Now we all know status is uh, HTML or quick file. So let's first cover the libraries file because normally you only have one libraries file in your team. But again, that implies that you're going to make a blob. So 
A library's file of status messages dot uh, of the status messages component looks like this. The library, the name is the same as the name of the component, and then your CSS is in this, so just relatively, because it's just there. From the libraries, you just link to the CSS and the JS in the this folder. Quite simple to explain. There's not a lot of triple funkiness in this. Um, and now comes a really aha moment. Well, at least for me. If you open up the html.pick file, then it all nicely falls together. This is what groups everything together. This file will be used by Drupal backend, and in there, we attach the library we just created. Which is really cool, because Drupal has been intending for us to do this for a very long time. Um, but we've never been able to get it this far that we have the right tooling and the structure to make it easy to do it this way. So the quick recap. You have the libraries of the file. In there, you link to the JS and to the CSS in your dist folder, and that library gets attached, literally, to the html.twig. The Drupal then picks up html.twig, and boom, you have a teamed functional Drupal front-end component. It has been this easy since the very start, yet none of us have been doing this. Um, now, what are the advantages of doing it this way? One of them is lowered complexity. Now, this is a very simple one, but I really wanted to show you this. Um, when you write CSS or SAS, you know when you're like, all right, I'm going to load it in an image, right? And you go, dot, 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 dot. Then you check, one, two, three, dot, dot, four. Images, slash, this, slash, compile, slash, image of PNG. And it doesn't work. And you go back, one, two, three, four, four. <laughs> That's ridiculous. So, if, if you now just... Your CSS is right next to your image, where it should be, because it's a component. So you, have, you just have to say, just have to say HDMI, please work. Beep, beep. Now, I know this term is being used a lot for random things. Now, for me, scalability means you have the flexibility of nested. For example, in components, you would have a global and a local component. But what if you're working on it and all of a sudden you are going to make an article variation of your node? And my suggestion would be well, you overwrite. If you just need to change some HTML for the article nodes, you overwrite the HTML for node hyphen hyphen article.html.twig. I don't dare to go close to the thing. Um, <laughs> um, and you create your... flexibility <laughs> to group them nest them. So you can very easily just say, well, I'm going to group them in the node because all of those node components have belong together. The one is the variation of the other. Huh. Well, you can almost see it, but you can get the point, right? After a while, if you have a used or a big project, it could start looking like this. You group them in the node, and then you first group them in their content type, and then you group them in their view modes. Just nicely scales however you want to group them. If you want to group your components based on the first letter, go ahead. It's a stupid idea, but you could. It doesn't really matter. Um, you have a lot of readability. Now, um, you have readability because you can group things together very nicely. It nicely belongs together. If you give this project to a 
front-end developer that has never done Drupal, it's very clear. This is your CSS, this is the HTML that it belongs to, this is JavaScript that it belongs to. The only bit you have to explain is the libraries. That's easy enough. Now, you have teamed functional Drupal front-end components, and I think that's the main point I want to get across. If you work on this, and if you would think like, oh yeah, I could work like this, you have a lot of other advantages. Performance, for example, is a major one. Five out of six websites that have been investigated. I saw when I put this upwards. Random. Okay. Um, just under there. I think if you put it upwards, it kind of stays up in phone under. Um, so, performance wise, it's a major advantage too. You have um, five out of six websites from the top thousand websites that have been um, seeing that, that their performance issue is on the front end here. It's not on the back end. It's on the front end because we compile all of our stuff together. So if Drupal has been smart enough to know in which context to load which CSS, but if we load all of our CSS into one library file, it can't. It literally can't. If we work in this way, then we rather load CSS into the node component. And where does that CSS get loaded? Well, it gets loaded in the node pages. It doesn't get loaded in taxonomy pages because there are no nodes there. Same thing if you would write it in a page component. Well, the page component, well, both of them are going to be a page because they're both going to use a template of the page. And there, the CSS is going to get loaded in both. And Drupal is smart enough to aggregate all that CSS into one. And if you now think that's a bit of an overkill, well, Drupal modules do this all the time. That's how they work. But none of them have, none of the Drupal backend people that are not here have explained it decently enough to us. That's how I feel anyway. Um, in the end, I, I saw, don't you, damn it. <laughs> I don't know if you have a different cable. There's a little gray cable that you could. So it means that you only load in one of every 10 lines of the CSS in JavaScript. Well, it, it just works that way. We saw a massive project we worked on a big team for two years on that we only load in JavaScript and CSS that that page actually needs. And we never have to tell people about it because we just attach the wrong CSS to the right component. You have the readability and scalability and the performance just like that. You also have conditional load. Now this is really cool. Uh, you have conditional loading. Um, it's kind of the same thing, but people kind of tend to forget this. What if you have on one project created a views infinite scroll component and you just plug it into the new project, but in there you don't have the module enabled yet, then Drupal will never start looking for this HTML file. It literally doesn't give anything <laughs> around finding this HTML file. It doesn't care. It simply doesn't care. You can make HTML.twig files in your Drupal team. Drupal is never going to care until you enable the module. So this project, look, I'm just standing in the middle. <laughs> this project is never going to use actually um, that HTML file and therefore the attached libraries file is also not going to be used. If both of them are not going to be used, I don't know if it's only here or come on. It's never going to be used because that library file is only attached into this HTML file. And therefore, the CSS file is never going to get loaded. So it's purely plug and play. And then, as soon as you enable the module, then Drupal's going to go, oh, 
I'm going to need the HTML file from this module. And as soon as that module gets that HTML file, it's going to say, oh, that HTML file um, has, has a library attached to it. Oh, that library is using CSS. Oh, I'm going to take the CSS and I'm going to put it in the aggregated CSS. And boom, you have literally conditionally loaded components. You also have great maintainability. I'm going to try to go a bit fast because I'm losing a bit of time and I don't have that much extra. Um, let's say you write a bug into your Node JavaScript because there is a toggle in your nodes somewhere very specifically. And you're not going to break your entire UI once you make a mistake. You're only going to break the maybe UI, but it's JavaScript, in the node page that you wrote the bug in. If you just have a taxonomy page, then the taxonomy page is not going to have that bug. Um, the taxonomy page is not going to have that bug where it breaks the complete UI. Because why should it? Because if you no longer load in all the JavaScript you write into every single piece of page, then that won't happen. I'm just going to try to continue. Ignore these very fine people. Um, <laughs> so this node JavaScript is only going to get loaded into the node page. It's not going to get loaded into that taxonomy term page. So you have a very nice flexibility and scalability because all of a sudden you're going to find the combination that you're going to go, well, uh, this combination doesn't work. Like for example, this HTML high table and this laptop's not going to work. So we know that this is now a bug, but just this combination. Kind of works the same thing on the web. Whew, winging it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you also have uh, drag and drop components. Um, and those drag and drop components, as I said, you can drag and drop them across projects. And if you can drag and drop them across projects, you can also drag and drop them across developers. Which also means that those developers don't have to work for the same company, but you can drag and drop them between companies. And all of a sudden, we create this open source mechanism that we can perfectly work together on the same front end components. Now, another advantage. Flexibility. If you now go, well, Matthew, I'm not very sure about that component. Like, if you have to write an HTML and a library for everything and a CSS and a JavaScript, I don't like that. I don't, I don't, I don't like it. I'm probably not going to use it. But there is a lot of flexibility that you could consider. The component I showed has it all: has HTML, CSS, libraries. It doesn't need that. You could just write CSS only component. Because why not? If you want to make an abstraction for CSS only, then you just make a libraries file and a CSS file. And that's a component. And then maybe you can write an HTML only component where you load in that CSS only component. Because it's just the flexibility and scalability of the thing. Um, because why not? Why do we keep merging everything together all the freaking time? Or a JavaScript only component. Or a JavaScript and CSS only component that hangs on to one certain class. Or an HTML and CSS only component. Or a JavaScript and HTML only component. Whatever variation you can think of, it's going to work because it's built on the fundamentals of the web. HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Now, that's the new theme structure. And I really hope that's clear enough and the point kind of gets across. Um, working in this way uh, could be tricky because you have to have a tooling system that always compiles this to this folder, always compiles it in the right manner. I've invested loads of free time into this. That's kind of a miracle I'm not bald yet. Um, I, I did this in a way that I don't in Gulp. I know it's Gulp, question that words. Um, it's in a Gulp file.js. If you download the team, it's just inside of Gulp file.js where all the setup is stored. Um, inside this Gulp file, uh, quite straightforward also, you just have to, uh, you can only touch the files that end on config.js. So project.config.js, local config, and config.js. Very high similarity here to the settings of PHP file. The local .settings.php file you would ignore in your Drupal setup, same way you would ignore it into your yeah, cable, it's not really. Hmm. Uh, so you can write npm install or yarn install and then say go, and it will work. Or you don't, as you're, if you're a backend, you don't do that, and it's just going to keep working too. Now, the new tooling workflow. Um, have loads of advantages. That's already the how of the new tooling workflow. Um, the advantages of it is that you have local environment options. Now, even if you can't see this, in local settings of PHP, you have where you define how your local setup works. In local config.js, the few times you can see the slides quickly read, you're going to see that you can 
fill in the things that you can option or that you can have as a developer. If you use browser sync, the other person in your team might not want to use browser sync, but that's fine. You just have a local setup that can accommodate both. Um, and the same way that we have settings for each developer, we also have the settings for all developers. So cross environment options, because in there, project.conf.js, you then want to define the things that can't be different cross versions or cross developers, I mean. Because this actually is going to have an impact on your end result. And that's the thing we're working towards, so that's quite important. The advantages of the Gulp setup is that we now have auto maintained disk folders component specific. You know, it's clear enough? Yeah. So if you drag the logo into it, it's going to create a disk folder wherever it needs where the optimized logo is in it. If you rename that logo, it's going to maintain your disk folder. It's also going to rename file in disk folder. It just works. You no longer have to go, ah, oh, we now have 10 images, like a history of things when we rename it. Um, it's the exact same thing also for SAS and for JavaScript. Um, we also have lossless image optimization. You kind of know this. I'm going to skip through that. You drop in a bunch of images and they get optimized. Um, we have linting in JavaScript with native um, pop-up. When there is an error in your OS, I'm also going to quickly go through that. I'm going to give you the slides, but I want to get through the, the complete thing. We also have JavaScript amplification. Not the same thing as aggregation, but it's also in there, embedded by default. We have Babelify, we have Browser file for people that want to write cutting edge JavaScript. Um, it even works in the same way that the lints, if you have the Babelify enabled or not. We have auto prefixing CSS, um, just post CSS, literally. You also know how that works. We have component based compiler. Now I'm going to dive into this one a little bit more because that's the thing I've been doing now for the teaming. I've also been doing it for the tooling. We also, like, this is so important. If you compile page.scss, or if you save that file, and it's only going to generate the CSS file into the page component. It's not going to compile all of your CSS all the time. It's component-based tooling. Which means that we can now have one goal set up for multi-teams. Because code doesn't really care how many teams you have. It listens to components only. If you, if you compile one CSS file, it's going to generate this one CSS file. So how would, that, how would you do that? Well, the first thing you download, you just drag these files out of it. Now, these are just extra files. You drag them to the root of your project, of your Drupal installation, um, and then inside your project.config.js, you say, well, I actually have more than one team. And these, this path is generally just empty because it's in the default folder. Then you just fill in the path like, oh, I have one team, then I have another team. And they should both compile with gold. Because it's just component-based anyway. Um, and that's really, really cool. A few more advantages. The Gulp is smart enough to know when to clear the cache. So, Gulp will rebuild the cache for Drupal. Um, every time you add, rename, move, or remove an HTML.twig file. As a Drupal front-end developer, you should always know this stuff. When this happens, you should clear your cache. But we never do. We never do. And every time we change something, we're sure, not sure, like, hmm, not sure if it's a cache clear or not. You go to the command line and you run cache here or cache rebuild, which is silly. Our tool should be able to do that for us. It also um, gets triggered when you change, move, or remove uh, a library.yaml file, um, and that's it. If you just change the content of an HTML twig file, it's not going to clear the cache. You should disable your caching mechanism to not have to clear the cache all the time. It's also refactor friendly, and this is also a big one because. As a front-end developer, if you're doing front-end development, then it means you're doing a lot of refactoring. You're always refactoring. If you're not refactoring when you're doing front-end development, you're not doing front-end development, you're adding front-end development. And that's a big difference, because that's how you create legacy projects. Um, so it's very refactor-friendly in the way that you have a folder named test variation that's empty, that's inside the testy component, right? You duplicate this testy.js file, and you name it testy hyphen variation. And you're going to see it nicely appear in the disk folder too, because Gulp is just running. If you drag it into a subfolder, it's going to create a disk folder there, it's going to remove it from the original disk folder. It just works, because it's component-based. Now, 
We can also just rename components, we can drag them around, we can do whatever, it's not going to break, you don't have to rerun Go. It's just going to work. And we have loads more like that. We have sense globbing, we have source mapping, browser sync, auto cleaning up of empty directories, loads, just to keep you working at a fast pace. You don't have to explain to your employer what you tried on the front end layer this time, which is a big one. Um, so that's a tooling workflow, right? So this is just the team. The thing I want to cover now is the platform that we're going to be able to share components between each other. The platform to share is quite simple to explain actually, because we all know Drupal.org and many of you have worked on Drupal.org or worked on Drupal projects where um, you could just download modules, you didn't have to do it through a composer. So I want to go back into that moment in time because it's platform just in the making, I just launched this. Um, and it works very similar because if you go to Drupal.org, you would click the big blue button on the top right corner and you download Drupal Core. And then, also, and then afterwards, we just scroll to the website and download this one and that one and that one. There are all the um, <laughs> I have lots more. If you download all those contract modules, then that's actually 95% of your Drupal project that you sold, the last one that you sold. Componi, it's going to work in exactly the same way. We have Componi.io, where you have a big orange button in the top right corner, where you download the team structure, you've got the tools already embedded into it, and then you can just download contribute components. That's simple. Well, hopefully, one of these days, those two platforms are going to merge, but I just want to keep moving fast, so this is kind of my idea. Now, it's not only idea. This already exists, so it's already live. You can use it today. Um, how are we going to do this? Because if you make an orange component, it's not going to work in your blue website. If you make components based upon a Lato font, it's not going to work in an open sans font project. So we have to, when we make a contribution to the project, when we make a component on the project, we have to make it color agnostic. Everything in the project is black and white. If you go to component.io, it's also a black and white website, and that's the point. It's a sketchbook. You start from the sketchbook where it's functional, themed, you just have to fill in the color because the team color is always different. That's very simple and easy and fun thing to do. Um, you also make it uh, font agnostic and variable agnostic inside your shots because you're going to name your variables different than you are. Maybe you just com uh, contribute your component with CSS only and you leave CSS out of it. Why not? This new platform to share has lots of advantages. For one, we can share information on components, which kind of looks like this. Maybe you want to put in an image. This is now the text drop-down component. You can say, well, it's using SAS, it's, it's responsive, it's going to use Drupal behaviors. It's accessible, but it still uses jQuery, right? It's still Drupal. Um, but that's just a drawback. It's just one of the drawbacks of this component. That's perfectly fine. It's built on the three components of the web, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and that's components. So we can share information, we can share instructions, we can share what it's going to be like if you download this component and you plug it into your project. You can also collaborate on components very similar to how we collaborate on Drupal.org projects. You have a GitLab page where, or GitLab repository for each component that's contributed automatically, which means that you're going to have all the tools GitLab offers. Like the web IDE, where if you have a little bug, you don't have to clone the entire component, the repository, to change something. No, you can just go in. You just go, oh, I'm going to change this, I'm going to make it commit right inside the browser. It's pretty cool. Now, Drupal.org is also merged, or not merged, um, transported to using GitLab instead of GitHub. So that's also a big advantage. You could have issues on popular components. Hopefully not too many. Now, up until now, the Similarities between Drupal.org and Component.io are quite obvious, right? You download a big chunk and then you download options into it. Um, the thing that I want to highlight that are different is this. Each functionality in Drupal.org exists once. You only have one module that does what Views does. It's called the Views module. Now, it's in core, but it's kind of the same thing. We have functionality that's only once. In Drupal.org. In Componi, it's different because we're all opinionated, and that's a good thing. Because if we're opinionated, then we can all make our own variations. Maybe one of us is going to make a material cookie compliance component because I know all of us have teamed this already. 
and it's really shit in the team. Um, and we might make this component, but then someone else might go, mm, I don't really like it, I forked it, I made a different one. Uh, I'm going to name it smooth cookies. It's going to be based upon the same module, e cookie compliance. Uh, it's going to have the same machine name, so you should just not download the same <coughs> component or a component that is similar to the other component. So you have loads of variations of the same module. So if we start envisioning, and this is now the first part that doesn't exist yet, I just whipped it up in the browser, um, we could say, well, if we download the uh, compliance module, we could on the Drupal.org page say, well, we're not going to download it this way, we're going to use Composer, but we still share information on the module pages. We're going to download one of the variations. Because why not? Why do we still keep doing everything ourselves? Pretty cool, right? But this doesn't exist yet. All the rest I showed you existed for now. Um, some components will also nicely work together with other components, which means that we should have component collections. So it's also built inside the platform, where you can say, well, this component nicely fits together with that component, so I'm going to make a collection out of it, so you can just download collections instead of separate components. It's also a difference between Drupal.org. Now, there is a lot of things that are very similar. For example, this is open source. So, if you like this, you could also, I need to see a bug, and or this doesn't work, or that doesn't work. You could dive in and you can collaborate on enhancing a team setup. Because every company we work in, we all have the same Kickstart team, base team. We all do it separately. We all have these silos of companies, but why? And I know we all do, I work for enough companies. I got fired in enough companies to know this. <laughs> That's a good thing. Um, so we could work together on enhancing team skeleton. For example, is there a webpack already in it? Yes. Atomic design? Yes. Less support? Yes. Post CSS? Yes. React? View? Yes. But it's not actually practical in it yet. For now, it's just inside your head. And I would love to see you contribute it. Um, we could also work together on the community-based tooling. Because, okay, tell your neighbor what the node version is of the last project that you worked on. It's silly. We're not really proud of it. I don't know what the last node version is. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're an eight. <laughs> um, like, or, or, or tell your neighbor when the last time was when you successfully ran updates on your NPM packages. It's a mess. I'm really sad. And I'm pretty sure other people are too. Because it's just a mess always to do. Um, or what is the last time you manually went into your command line and you ran Drush CR? It's silly. It's 2019. Why do we still do all these manual things because of the triple funkiness? We should, there is so much optimization or, or in Drupal backend that we should have the same thing in Drupal frontend. And this is what this movement is about. Another advantage is that we have now documentation and conventions, such as um, Component naming conventions, nesting conventions, the PHP functions you should or could know as a front end dev to get a bit further in your team components. Um, we have hook extending conventions, twig extending conventions, loads of that. We have documentation that is front end focused. Because Drupal has always been very back end focused, and I want to reclaim what we can do with the front end. Now, if you put it all together, because that's all we have, nice, matter, whatever, um, it kind of looks like this. You go to the platform, um, and for example, I've now outputted some status message codes. So it comes from four teams, classic templates, status messages.html.twig. That's the default output of classic. It just looks like that. And it works. If you, work, if you ask a backend developer, that's perfect. If you go to the platform, you go to the status message component that I showed you in the beginning, you could say, well, I'm going to download this thing. It's file and flat design. You download your component, yes, it's just downloading, very simple like that for now. Um, you go to your project, you go to your components, component is a team, you drag it into your components, and now you should be able to see Drupal caches rebuild, because you added an HTML file into it. And then you go back to your project, which is there, local host, um, it's rebuilt, so it takes some time. And now you're going to have to have the patience of around 10 seconds because this is not the modern laptop. And I just rebuilt cache, so it takes some time. Uh, so it's reloading the page now. 
that's literally just that's nothing to do with the actual theming structure, luckily. So you read out the page and now you should see the component themes. But this is now one with a smiley. Uh, this is the output of Drupal set message. And if you inspect that, then you see, well, and now it comes from messages, status messages, and it comes from component components, status messages. It just works. I think that's amazing. Well, why haven't we been doing this since Drupal 6? Now, that's the end of my presentation. I see I covered 44 minutes, so I'm pretty close. Um, so that's good. And I want to close on these notes. I want to close on the note that my name is still Matthias Pelleby. Uh, and since four years, I had the privilege of finding people that believe in the exact same dream as I did. Um, with a team of volunteers, for example, with Mark and also Fabia, we've, we've been able to uh, reach tens of thousands of people all across the globe. We've been organizing, in the four years that I've now been doing Combat United, I've been organizing 22 conferences. Um, bringing people together that have the same passion as I do, Drupal and frontend. And with just a few volunteers, we were able to get massively far. And I'll, I'm not going to be able to do Compony all by myself. So with Compony, I'm hoping to find people that have the same passion as I do and find the same benefit as I do. Um, so if, you're, if there's any bone in your body that feels like, yeah, I might like what Max is doing, join me. If um, if you like this, tell your colleagues. If you don't like this, don't tell your colleagues. Contribute and then tell your colleagues. Because it's open source. You can't complain about something that's open source. Um, <laughs> if, if you do like this, then tell your employer. It's a very small thing uh, to get a paid account on Compony. Everything is, is for free if, you, if you're using it openly. Um, but get a paid account if you want to support it. Um, it's peanuts for, for your employer, but it makes a massive difference in, in me keeping up this platform and this initiative. So help me help you. I also give workshops, presentations, um, so any idea you have, please come talk to me after the session, because um, I would love to have some company on the walk, on the uphill walk. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is there time for questions? Yeah. Like five minutes. All right, very good. Yes. Uh, two questions actually. Uh, so thanks. Um, um, I think it's really. Uh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, I, I kind of knew that this was possible, but um, the thing that has been stopping me from from like really spitting up all these CSS stuff is that I'm not sure what happens if you like do not come. Compile everything into a blob, and Drupal's gonna create aggregate uh, CSS files for every page you load. Yes. Right? So, for every page, um, another aggregation of components is going to be downloaded, and would not that in the end mean that the end user is downloading more CSS instead of just downloading one blob in the first request and then having that cache for the rest of all pages? Yes, it's a very good question. Let me first answer that first question because I believe I have another one. Um, no, you have another one. I have some questions for you. Uh, it's a very interesting question. I want to compare it to the caching mechanism. We have caching in Drupal, right? And there's loads of caching embedded in Drupal. We cache on this layer, we cache on that layer. We cache on loads of things. I did a presentation three years ago in Milan. I think it was in the Dead or something else. I think it was in Milan where I showcase that in Drupal 7, when we use service workers, we have offline support, and we can cache all of our front-end things together. I did it together with Nod, the JavaScript maintainer of Drupal uh, 7 I don't know how that works completely. And after our session, because we, we made it work literally five minutes before the session, because it was hypothetical before, we made it work five minutes after, and we showed it to everyone, and we go, would you love this in core? And no one was interested. We were able to literally disable the caching for front-end, for aggregating, for everything. In Drupal, no one was interested. Offline capability, caching, why? Because it was a solution coming from front-end developer. We thought, as a front-end developer to a back-end community, we were able to disable our caching that's going to work super fast. And they weren't interested. 
Now, the aggregation is kind of the same thing. The aggregation of Drupal and Leap aggregates files together based on contexts. For example, if you log in, then you're going to create a different context, and then Drupal is going to download all the files that only logged in users need in a certain aggregated file. Now, all of those contexts are also page specific. So there's loads of CSS, for example, the views module, that only gets loaded on certain pages. Which also means that Drupal Backend is already doing this, and we already have that disadvantage. But let me go one step further. What if we disable our aggregation? Now, there's a backend in the room. I'm ready to touch some tomatoes, but if you disable the aggregating layer, and we live in an HTTP2 world, then it's actually better to have multiple single files, and it's better to have singular, small, files. Even better, what if, uh, let me go back, what if we go even one step further, what if we disable aggregation and we don't attach it in the library, but instead, let me see, let me see, these are the advantages, what instead if we attach, ah, here we go, if we don't say attach library, because in Drupal 8 we're going to have attach JS and attach CSS, what if we say we're literally going to make a link tag here, link src, uh, link to your HTML file, and then there you're going to say um, type CSS, HTML, and we're going to literally link it inside of our HTML. And all of a sudden we have progressive rendering in browsers, by default, coming from Drupal 8. We can't do this already, it's already there. But we haven't had the push forward, and we haven't been able to research enough because we haven't been working together as front-end developers. And that's what this movement is about. And I'm very sure the aggregation is going to turn on some people where they might have lower results, but we get ourselves ready for massive, big advantages otherwise. So for all you know, if it goes worse, your performance, disable your aggregation and we try it. Because you have super small files, you only have 1 in 10 files that you ever download. And those files are going to get cached, because those don't... You're going to get cached on, on your, your mechanism. Sorry, it's probably the only explanation for that. Okay, so, so in short, don't, don't worry about the number of requests, worry about the kilobytes, that's what you're saying. Yes, in some context. But that's not always going to be true. Um, let's say on your project it doesn't work then you just make one global library and you literally say I'm going to require all the libraries in my project and then you ship that and then you're going to have the same exact aggregation as you have now but you're still going to be ready for the future where you can share components between each other Phew, that was a way better answer than the first one <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, so the other question was how do you handle overrides or, or variants or inheritance like, like different um, view modes of the same node or, or We already have um, a naming convention coming from Drupal. There are a lot of front developers that want to create team hooks and then create a whole new HTML file to then rename it into something abstract no one knows about, that's only in their heads. Um, and then they, let me find it, but we have a, a, a teaming mechanism where we say uh, 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 where we say that we have yeah like this we have already a naming convention on them where we say it's going to be no hyphen hyphen article and article is a variation of nodes this is going to be the teaser variation of article nodes it's already in Drupal but we keep reinventing ourselves and we keep not seeing it because it's so big and this is Flexible in that you can create your own team suggestions too, but it's still going to have this naming convention where we can nicely structure them together. But that's a answer. Yeah. Okay. I'm also going to keep rambling on about this the whole day, so if you find me afterwards, I also have stickers. Uh, so besides the actual uh, Drupal caching, uh, your browser will actually cache the CSS file if you load in a singular CSS file at the start. Yes. That means if you load in different CSS on different pages, 
it will actually take longer for pages to load instead of having just one singular CSS file being cached in your browser whenever you start the website. But that singular CSS file is not the same now anyway. The singular CSS file is only the same if you load the exact same page. That's going to be the same case for us. Because otherwise, modules have to change too. Because the views module, the view CSS is only being loaded whenever there is a view on your page. But that already um, breaks the caching mechanism that every aggregate CSS file should be the same. Because the attaching of CSS and JavaScript, or the attaching of libraries, has always worked in this way. So the idea of that exact same file is actually not true. Um, it's going to be true in a lot of cases, but that's going to be the same thing for this. I think it caches on four different contexts. Uh, but again, we could just disable it and load it all in your global library. You can define one library into all the rest, and all of your libraries are going to load it on every page. And then you might think, imagine, it's idiotic. Why would you load every CSS file on every page? But we already do.